Welcome to Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. Today we're going to normalize a wave function. What's that? Well, basically, it's just making a wave function behave properly. And if you recall, when we take a wave function and we square it, that's in the red here, that gives us an idea of the chances of finding an electron. So we're pretty likely to find it here, we're pretty likely to find it here, and we're not going to find it there. And what we know is that if I add up the chances of finding it over all these regions where our wave function exists, that it has to add up to 1. Why is that? Well, what that's saying is if I add up the probability, my chances of finding it anywhere, it must be 100% or 1. Same thing's true if I take a basketball and I chuck it into a gym. Somewhere in that gym, I will find that ball. I just put it in there. So what's the chances of finding it in over the whole gym? 100%. It must be there. Doesn't make sense for it to be 700% or 30% because it's somewhere in that gym. And we're going to do that same thing with our wave functions. You might also notice over here there's this RE in front of the wave function before we square it. And that stands for real. So what we're plotting there is just the real portion of the wave function. This is going to be important in just a second. What that's telling us is wave functions are sometimes a complex value. That is, they include the letter I. And that's going to that's going to help us understand how we're going to square a wave function. And I'll show you how in a second. So how are we going to normalize these things? Well, what we're going to demand is that when we add up the chances of finding it over all the space where the wave function is defined, it has to be equal to 1. How are we going to add up the chances? Well, that's where we're going to use an integral. Remember that an integral is adding up bits and pieces of something. So when we add up all the chances of finding it somewhere, we must get 1. And that's the critical condition that we're going to use to normalize our wave functions. This turns out to be the wave function squared, but it's written a little differently. This is where that RE thing comes in. Notice that star there. That asterisk tells me that that part of the wave function is what's called the complex conjugate. And all that means is that if our wave function has the letter i in it, we're going to switch its sign and put that one up front. And that's just the standard way to square a complex value function. I'll link to another video below that will talk a little bit more about why that is. Okay, let's go ahead and do an example. Here we've been given the wave function a times the exponential of i in x. And we want to normalize that. Our problem says determine the value of a such that the following wave function is normalized from 0 to 2 pi. So that's the bounds of our integral. It's telling us the range over which the wave function is defined. So the first step we're going to do is we're just going to write down our complex conjugate. That turns out to be a pretty easy step. How do we do it? All we do is we flip the sign of i. So if I see a negative i, I'm going to write a positive i. If I see a positive i, I'm going to write a negative i. Notice in our problem here we have a positive i, which means our complex conjugate is going to have a negative i. So it's going to give us negative i in x. Now step two says set the integral of the complex conjugate times the original wave function equal to 1. We're just using this formula. So that means I'm going to do the integral from 0 to 2 pi. That's the bounds given in our problem. The bounds will be given somewhere in your problem when you normalize a wave function. Then we're going to write the complex conjugate first as the uh, formula tells us. And that's important. Later on in quantum mechanics problems, if you screw that up, you'll get the wrong answer. So make sure that you write the complex conjugate first, which means we're going to write down this guy first. That's going to give us a e to the negative i n x times our original wave function, a e to the positive i n x, and then add our dx. What's that equal to? 1. This is an algebra equation. On the left-hand side, we have an integral, and on the right-hand side, we have the number 1, but it's just an algebra equation. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the algebra equation to solve for the value of a as the problem requests. Now, the reason we set it to 1 is to make our a normalize the wave function, to make it add up to 1. So we're going to keep solving this integral, but we're going to keep that equals 1 all the time. Don't drop it, because if you drop it, then you might get confused later on and forget that it's an algebra equation and give the answer to your integral instead of the value of a. All right, let's go ahead and evaluate this integral. First, what we're going to do is we're just going to pull out these a's. Sometimes you'll see n's used for these normalization problems or b's. It doesn't matter. It's just some constant that we're using to normalize it. Another thing to keep in mind is that when we're multiplying two exponentials, all we're going to do is add their exponents together. So when we simplify it, we're going to get a squared up front, still the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And now we're going to get e minus n pi x. Sorry, there's no pi there, minus i and x. And then we're going to just add that to our other exponent. Whenever we add 
or whenever we multiply two exponential functions, we just add what's uh, up top. And so we're gonna add negative i and x to positive i and x. That's all equal to one. Remember, don't drop that one. All right, now, what's our next equation? Well, when I add negative i and x to positive i and x, that just gives me zero. Just like if I did five minus five, or six minus six, or negative x plus x, that's gonna give me zero. So I'm gonna get a squared, let's do blue. I'm gonna get a squared, integral of zero to two pi still, of e to the zero, dx equals one. What's e to the zero? That's one. Anything raised to the zero power is one, and so that means we're gonna get a squared integral of one, zero to two pi, dx is equal to one. Now you see why maybe I chose this as a wave function. It's an easy one to integrate, and what you should really be learning here is how we use integration to solve for a. Of course, there are many harder integrals you have to do, uh, but that's just really integration, not normalization. So if there's a harder integral you need to use, check out my video on an integral tables, and you can use those integral tables then to solve harder integrals. All right, let's continue. When we integrate this guy, the integral of one is just x from zero to two pi. That's still equal to one. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a squared and we're gonna go ahead and evaluate. We plug in the top bound minus the bottom bound equals one. That means what we're gonna get is a squared times two pi equals one. Then we're gonna solve for a. So I just divide both sides by two pi and I take the square root. It's gonna get rid of my square portion over here and we're gonna get that a is equal to the square root of one over two pi. That is the value of a, so strictly speaking, the problem is solved, but our wave function, it's important to keep in mind, is now square root of one over two pi e to the i and x. That's the wave function you use for every quantum mechanics problem involving the wave function we just defined. So never go back to the unnormalized form if you're, say, solving for probability or expectation values or anything. You always want to use the normalized form. That's the correct wave function. The unnormalized form is raw and unpolished and can't be used to solve quantum mechanics problems. Now we can use that to solve problems. Thanks for watching this video on normalizing wave functions. Go ahead and subscribe by clicking the Real Chemistry link below or check out another video that you see to my right. Thanks for watching.